Thank you, everybody, for being here for the last plenary session on energy efficiency this morning. And it's my pleasure to host Andreas Leschel for the last plenary. Uh, Andreas is professor of uh, energy resource economics at the University of Münster, where he's also directing the Center on Applied Economic Research. Um, he is the chair also of the Energy Aspect Commission of the German government, and uh, he has been among the leading authors of the working group in the IPCC 5. Fifth report. Um, I came across his work several times. Uh, in particular, I enjoy what he's doing on China with Frank Yotso. And as I'm interested in on emission trading, as you know, and on linking perspectives, uh, I had to learn a lot from uh, his work on the Chinese uh, uh, side. Um, one of the things that uh, I'd like to mention uh, is that uh, Andreas has been uh, indicated by several journals, the Handelsblatt and the Frankfurter Allgemeine Zeitung, I think, if I remember well, as uh, among the most influential uh, economists, uh, top 50, uh, whatever this rank means, but uh, it's they say something. So we have a very influential German economist today, and we are very glad to be influenced by him. So, Andreas, the floor is yours. Okay, thanks, Simone, for the nice introduction. Um, so I, I recognize that um, the other plenaries were, were dealing with um, uh, climate policy and uh, um, the issues um, that are... Um, there on uh, minimum prices, uh, on how to get prices ongoing and, and how to implement this. Uh, this. This plenary, I was asked to talk about energy efficiency and I think that probably complements nicely, hopefully nicely, um, as well as some of the sessions uh, that we are uh, hearing in this uh, great workshop. So thanks for organizing all that. I've been to um, uh, two sessions that deal explicitly with energy related issues, uh, which are obviously in the core of many of these discussions that we are having, and I would like to uh, start uh, my talk uh, with just a picture from the German electricity market uh, in January 2017 um, to motivate a bit uh, why we are talking about energy efficiency and demand flexibility. Uh, the, the German government, uh, which I'm as well advising, um, uh, has put a lot of effort in increasing the uh, capacities of renewables in the recent years. Uh, nowadays, we are in a situation where we have around 100 gigawatt of conventional power plants in Germany and around 100 gigawatt of um, renewable power plants uh, in Germany. So um, this is really remarkable, increasing very fast in the last years. Of course, as well due to a uh, quite generous uh, feed-in tariff system that was implemented uh, around 2000 in Germany and since then extended. Um, so um, that's the good part of the story. Now Germany has uh, almost 35% uh, of electricity coming from renewable sources, but uh, the um, the other side of the story you can uh, see here, uh, which is, as I said, a picture of January 2017, so uh, beginning of this year, where I show you on the one hand the demand for electricity that's in gray, uh, the electricity generation then from different sources. Um, so the demand is this re little red line uh, here. And then you see the conventional power plants in, in dark gray uh, and the uh, renewables, solar in yellow and uh, wind on and offshore in blue. Uh, actually, it's difficult to see because they were not really delivering on these days. Uh, and uh, this shows you that uh, in terms of secured capacity, of course, we, we, we really have a big problem now um, uh, if we rely uh, heavily on renewables. Uh, in this situation, it was not a really severe problem because, as I told you, Germany has still 100 gigawatt of conventional power plants. So even in these times, you can see that the conventional production, this dark gray is higher than the red line, which is the load. <laughs> 
uh, which means we were still exporting all the time. Uh, so thanks to our uh, uh, coal power plant, no, we were supplying still electricity to France and other countries. Um, but of course, if we think a little bit ahead, we want to have these conventional power plants gone. Now that's the idea behind the, the carbon pricing, the minimum prices that we talked about. So they should go and uh, the conventional should fill this gap. And uh, therefore it becomes clear that this will not be feasible at the moment, uh, and we have to think about two things. The first is how we can reduce the total electricity consumption, so that's the efficiency question, but we will as well have to think about how we can make electricity demand more flexible, uh, in uh, that we can really use times where renewables are delivering, now intermittent renewables are delivering, where we can uh, make best use of this electricity, which is at the moment as well not possible, uh, because we, uh, we at the moment are wasting as well more and more of these good electricity because it cannot be um, really brought into the grid and brought to the consumers and that's uh, uh, indeed a problem. So this is the the situation that we are having, and as I said, we have, of course, very ambitious renewable goals, not only in Europe, but as well in, 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 in Germany. You know? So um, we, we want to uh, increase the share of electricity uh, coming from renewables substantially uh, in, in Germany, uh, and, um, and that means that we will face these situations where our um, supply is more or less exogenous and, and less controllable uh, due to natural conditions, and um, we have to think about how we uh, uh, develop uh, possibilities to equating demand and supply. And that's, uh, this situation, of course, is, uh, uh, in, uh, is um, um, severe because um, at the moment we um, uh, probably don't have a lot of options on the table. Uh, in Germany we are now starting um, uh, big um, research uh, initiatives that for example look at different types of storage technologies um, uh, ranging uh, from uh, battery storages to uh, power to something, power to heat, uh, power to liquids and so forth, uh, which try to uh, uh, kept to help uh, in this type of uh, situation uh, on the production side, but more and more we as well look at the demand side um, that uh, calls for, as I said, reducing the electricity that is used, but as well enabling um, um, adjusting household choices and giving more flexibility. Um, renewables, uh, for sure, um, have to be used as well efficiently um, if you think about the resistance that we are seeing uh, in the um, uh, new installations of uh, renewable um, sources in Germany, uh, if you think about large wind farms, for example, if you think about uh, photovoltaic installations, uh, large-scale photovoltaic installations, it's clear that we cannot just you know, scale up indefinitely uh, renewables, uh, uh, but as well there will be some limits on how much new installations, even if they would be cheap, um, are acceptable by uh, individuals. And uh, therefore, we have to, to be both you know, efficient and more flexible. And um, this is all problematic because we are more or less missing our targets uh, on all of these dimensions. So uh, we are very good on renewables uh, in Germany, and not only in Germany, but we are not good on efficiency. So on the right-hand side, you see a slide that shows our energy productivity targets in Germany. Uh, we want to be 2.1% more productive every year, we achieve about half of this, a uh, little bit more than 1%. Um, so that means we are really losing out on uh, these efficiency grounds. So um, the question is how could we go ahead? And I would like to draw attention uh, on especially uh, uh, the role of um, digitalization, what I call smart energy in this process. So if we think about uh, implementing policy tools for uh, affecting uh, consumer behavior, households and companies, um, it's clear that um, digital technologies are going to facilitate vastly this type of um, 
uh, approaches in terms of pricing, in terms of information, uh, and all these behavioral uh, uh, economics that we might think about. Um, so smart meters, for example, will pave the way for time-varying pricing uh, and therefore dynamic adjustment uh, of demand. Uh, and um, this is at the moment, at least in Germany and in many other countries, really something that is um, looking uh, ahead uh, because we, we barely have smart meters at the moment. We have a, a smart meter rollout program which has not really started, but you can uh, uh, really say that we don't have smart meters in Germany, no, that's fair to say, uh, which means that uh, all these options of time varying prices cannot be really uh, um, used because we simply don't have the technological uh, possibilities to do that, but we will have it in the future, and we are as well sure that you know, price structures that are necessary for incentivizing these type of shifts are indeed going to, sh to change sharply. So if you think about the, um, the, uh, the regulatory frameworks, uh, it's relatively clear that um, network charges are going to be uh, changing. We just heard, I just heard a presentation that as well looked at on this issue. Uh, so we will get more locational dependent network fees you know, uh, that would as well help um, bringing grid extension and renewables better uh, aligned. Uh, we will as well uh, have um, consideration of other um, extras uh, or charges on electricity because in the end, of course, we want to have electricity as cheap as possible. No, because the idea is that we are then as well shifting electricity to other sectors, uh, to the heating sector, to the transport sector, and as we know that you know, uh, renewables, they have almost uh, zero marginal prices or marginal costs. No, we want to have all other add-ons removed you know, from these sources in order to really make best use of electricity in other sectors. So price structures are going to, to change sharply, and of course these smart technologies are as well going to make um, some of these feedbacks uh, much easier uh, by using uh, in-home uh, displays, which uh, give rise for uh, things like um, uh, behavioral nudges, goal setting, social comparison, so forth. And um, we as well know that uh, there is, um, there are other things happening in the consumer sphere that are very relevant to describe energy demand in the future. Um, uh, we talk a lot about uh, willingness to pay for climate protection. Uh, that's of course as well driving some of these in, uh, these developments. But there is as well, and I think that's even more important, uh, a strong willingness to pay for self-generated electricity. So people really value self-consumption. And we see that already in Germany. Um, so even though there is not really an economic case of a PV plus battery system in Germany at the moment, a lot of people are buying it because they want to produce their own electricity. Um, and that will be a, a major driver of these developments, as I will uh, uh, touch upon uh, shortly uh, in the end of the presentation. So we have to take these type of developments uh, into consideration, which really, um, I think, uh, reshape the energy markets as we know them today. Uh, last week, we just started a new, what we call Virtual Institute Smart Energy, uh, which is dedicated exactly to this type of question. And since I'm directing this from the economic perspective, I thought I should do a little bit of advertisement. Um, so uh, with many universities as well in Germany that are going to look exactly on the role of these digital technologies uh, in the future of the energy markets. So what I would like to do uh, in the presentation is I would like to go through some of these um, possibilities to make uh, energy demand uh, uh, lower and more flexible uh, and see what we as well uh, have so far in terms of evidence you know, for these different policies uh, in other countries. I have to say since we don't have a lot of technology in, in, in Europe, we are lacking 
the uh, real evidence for the European cases, and uh, I will explore that a little bit later. Uh, but I'm going to show mainly examples from the US uh, on how to, um, how to assess the effectiveness of several of these um, uh, approaches, mainly using experimental uh, methods that try to identify and quantify causal effects of these policy interferences on individual decisions by doing doing uh, counterfactual analysis, uh, trying to understand how would uh, the individuals have behaved if the policy measures had not been carried out. Um, so so you're setting up um, uh, randomization and uh, control group designs to think about the role of price flexibility or the role of social norms, for example, in uh, affecting the behavior of um, individuals. Um, and I'm going to show you some of these, um, um, these analysis uh, and start with dynamic pricing because that's, of course, what um, uh, economists think about first. Okay, um, So uh, there is a, a very straightforward rationale to make uh, prices uh, dynamic uh, in order to um, replicate the demand and supply situation on the electricity markets and try uh, to have higher prices in uh, peak times uh, where demand is high, relatively high, and lower prices in off-peak times um, and uh, use these uh, price hikes um, to lower uh, peak demand, but as well to shift demand you know, to times where probably it's not so uh, difficult to meet these um, demands. And um, uh, if you look at the literature on uh, these, the role of the dynamic prices, you can find a few papers that try to do that and try to estimate impacts, for example, of dynamic pricing. So following um, uh, uh, the pricing schemes uh, on the wholesale market in the, uh, in the, um, in the contracts uh, to the ind individuals, what we see here is that price responses of households tend to be quite small first result. Uh, second result, um, uh, richer households tend to have a higher responsiveness to price changes, uh, which as well um, makes some sense in the short run, but as well in the long run, because they simply might have more flexibilities, you know? not only in the short run behavior, but as well, of course, I mean, they can as well have different energy investments in the long run, you know, making them more flexible to price changes um, in, uh, in these situations. So, um, so you can see that uh, here um, you, you uh, find in these type of experimental studies that indeed um, electricity uh, demand is reduced uh, with hourly pricing, uh, with critical peak pricing schemes, and that's a, a quite robust result. And you can as well look at a, um, a meta-analysis that uh, try to uh, collect more evidence on this. Uh, and I show you here on the left-hand side um, the peak reduction that you can achieve by um, um, having sp uh, larger spreads between peak and off-peak pricing. Okay, so that's the one thing that we want to look at. And the other one uh, is the, um, um, the, um, um, the reduction that you can achieve, uh, net, not only in terms of used pricing, but as well on this critical peak pricing, so using uh, more flexible uh, 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 ways or more severe ways on reducing peak demand. Uh, what you see here is that as you are increasing the peak to off-peak price ratios, uh, indeed you can as well increase the size of the effects that I showed you. So marginal effect can become more or higher and higher. Uh, but um, uh, again, in terms of political acceptability and implementation, the implementation of these policies, um, you have to keep in mind that uh, households, they react uh, very negative on price hikes. And of course, the whole uh, dynamic or flexible pricing schemes, they all depend on having high prices and sometimes and low price in the rest. And if you have um, uh, problems uh, or issues uh, uh, with risk averse and other things, no, people are probably not accepting you know, these high prices, uh, and, or you have to compensate them with very low prices you know, in, in their contracts uh, in order to make that acceptable. 
And the other thing is, um, if you do these type of things, you might as well think about uh, allowing um, then the um, distribution system operators or uh, the utilities to control part of your appliances. And there we as well see that you know this is as well really a problem uh, with many households. Uh, actually, I'm. I'm uh, Cameron, I think it's not here, but I'm, I'm working. Uh, Cameron, here, Cameron. Um, so I, I'm working uh, on this uh, as well with with folk from Oxford um, that as well uh, um, had some really nice um, results on um, on these acceptability issues. Uh, people are ex are accepting uh, are not accepting uh, if you control their refrigerator. But they're accepting if you control their washing machines, okay? Uh, which is, of course, weird, uh, because the one thing is probably not really affecting you a lot, no? But of course, if the washing machine runs in three o'clock in the morning, it's probably an issue. So you have to keep that in mind when implementing these type of policies. There is some literature on that. Uh, there is less literature on the uh, side of the companies. Um, so um, you really have to go back to 1994 or so uh, to find uh, papers now that look at the effect of dynamic pricing on companies. Um, and um, if you are doing this type of studies, you understand why this is the case. It's just really very difficult to find um, the companies uh, uh, to participate in this type of, of experiments. Uh, but there you can see there is, a, is some load shifting happening. Again, it's very small and you would have to have just very um, big incentives to make this happen, uh, which would uh, run in the same problems as I have said. So. Um, so stabilizing infrastructure by means of real-time pricing is, an, is a possibility, but it would require large price increases and it would burden low-income households. And therefore, from this political point of view, um, it seems to be quite difficult. And therefore, people move um, as well in more you know, soft interventions uh, on the demand side um, uh, to affect the demand for energy. And um, uh, there is a number now of behavioral effects that you might address, like social norms, like providing information, uh, or other psychological effects, like goal setting. Uh, in order uh, to change behavior um, or demand. Um, and um, of course, these uh, soft interventions could likely be easier, uh, could easier be implemented, uh, but it's not clear if and how uh, these interventions work. Um, uh, because of time issues, I think I probably have to hurry up a bit. Um, so we have done studies um, on consumer inattention, which is one of these um, uh, potential biases that you can try to address uh, with these soft measures. And you can show that, well, of course, um, um, if you um, provide additional information that has an impact indeed on the um, on the dem uh, on the on the uh, purchasing decisions, and people that are informed about the benefit uh, of the um, LED bulbs, um, they um, uh, they make different choices um, and partly um, uh, step back from this under undervaluation of energy costs relative to purchasing price. Um, so you get a, a reduction in these consumer biases uh, and um, shift demand curves upwards uh, with uh, information type of technologies and this is um, indeed um, something that relates to what we call the energy literacy among subjects so we for example ask people uh, about the real savings you now after uh, these information uh, treatments and uh, and as you can see here uh, the uh, treated group you now they are really better informed uh, on the real uh, savings so uh, we think that the observation um, of this result, people are, are uh, buying more energy efficient LED bulbs, um, has as well to do with our treatment. People become more educated. Uh, there is a, as well literature on the role of this uh, further information provision, uh, like this in home displays. Um, again, I probably just jump over this. There, I just want to mention that um, the, um, again, uh, the um, salience effect, we talked a bit about salience, is probably some something that is not so significant. It's probably more the learning effect, uh, which is a one-off effect, and you don't need then uh, you know, the continuing uh, um, um, displays. 
in, in order to, or the, in, uh, the attention uh, device uh, in order to reduce uh, your um, uh, energy demand, but it, it might be a, a good way to, uh, to initialize learning, and that can be done by uh, uh, in-home displays, but it can be as well done in other in other ways, and that's of course the rationale for a lot of the uh, activities we see as well on the governmental side, trying to educate people uh, on their energy use. Um, there is, uh, of course, as well some literature on goal setting, so nudges uh, can as well be used in this context, um, trying to set um, uh, goals uh, as um, uh, as reference points. Uh, to which then uh, individuals compare with uh, uh, making uh, consumption higher than the goal, then a psychological loss and consumption lower than the goal, a psychological gain. And you can see that goal setting has an effect on average uh, on, the, on the consumers. Um, but the effect depends on whether you are setting realistic goals. No? Uh, if you're setting realistic goals, which are low goals, uh, you can see that people are really reducing demand. If, the, if you set um, uh, goals that are not very ambitious, or if you set uh, over um, ambitious goals, then people are really not motivated by these type of goals, and you don't see a significant change on the demand patterns. So, um, so this is uh, what we find in literature. Where, where is literature heading? Um, so um, most of the previous literature looked at how does uh, or does the intervention have effects and what is the average effect, the average treatment effect that we are observing. Um, um, uh, recent papers more and more get interested in uh, the uh, on the welfare effect of this intervention. So does this intervention actually increase welfare? Uh, does it? not only have an effect, but is that a, uh, an effect that has an uh, welfare increases. And, um, and we as well had uh, papers, uh, Franz Will, you presented yesterday a paper on heterogeneous agents, so it's as well uh, going more and more into heterogeneity of effects. Now we are now so interesting on just the average, but more on the heterogeneity of this effect. So this is really about uh, behavioral welfare economics uh, with um, um, uh, the um, idea to elicit um, really this um, role of consumer uh, biases and uh, policies to address them. Um, so in this uh, type of literature, uh, you, um, you um, introduce uh, consumer then internalities, uh, internalities, uh, so choices that don't optimize consumer welfare in one way or the other, which might be explained by all these attention biases, present biases, uh, imperfect information, and so forth. And so these internalities then are the, the thing that you're interested in, and similar to you know, Diamond's optimal externality taxes, uh, this literature then uh, is looking at the optimal internality tax or internality subsidy that is addressing this misoptimization of uh, the individuals. And uh, like in the uh, uh, optimal tax case, they are interested in the average marginal biases. No? Um, so they are looking at the average valuation mistake of the consumers um, for these consumers whose cho choices are marginal to the policy change. So you are, dis you are distinguishing between decision utility and uh, so you're basing your decision on the decision utility and then your uh, experience utility and these two things are not uh, the same and this is where the inter internality uh, comes in. And, um, and you try to address this internality then by some measures like um, uh, information, probably as well by taxing or by uh, other legal mandates uh, in order to increase welfare of the individuals. So um, the question is how can you measure that? Um, and I am going to show just one example how this can be done um, um, by uh, experimental designs. Um, uh, the idea is that you are looking at uh, differences in willingness to pay between biased and uh, unbiased uh, consumer, and you compare how intervention eliminates these biases, for example, through information, um, through information um, provision in order to understand what's the net welfare effect of this policy, the perceived surplus of consumers now who otherwise had uh, purchased, for example, an, an incandescent light bulb, 
no? uh, uh, or uh, uh, plus the gain from internality reductions. And as I said, the idea then is to look at market demand curves and at, ma at uh, average marginal um, biases in order to assess that. That's um, um, what, what the, the formula where which I don't, don't uh, explain in detail because of time, uh, are um, simplification of Elke Taupinski paper from 2015 that look at these issues and find that uh, consumer indeed undervalue, uh, in this case, compact fluorescent lamps, CFLs, light bulbs, um, and try to measure what's the optimal subsidy um, uh, for uh, CFLs uh, using the formula that in the reduced form I'm giving here. Um, and um, uh, they do this um, by um, estimating demand schedules using um, uh, multiple price lists and then inform informing people and doing these multiple price lists again in, um, uh, within subject design uh, in order to understand what is the um, what's the conditional average treatment effect. And then they, uh, they are able to look at what's on the one hand the internality reduction um, by comparing these different demand curves. And on the other hand, what's the loss through the subsidy scheme? No, uh, here the Harberger Triangle. And then you get a, a range of optimal interventions. So it's not optimal to ban, for example, uh, the uh, incandescent light bulbs. No? Um, um, Totally, uh, because uh, uh, that, that is, uh, in terms of this welfare perspective, um, uh, not a good idea uh, because the distortions um, on the Harberger distortion side are too high, the losses are too high, but it might make some sense to move a little bit into um, these um, um, policy, e.g. E by subsidies, reducing the prices for these interventions or by, interve or by information. So, um, so to sum up, um, um, uh, uh, there, there is uh, indeed the problem of inflexibility of, of electricity demand, and we have, we have seen some possibilities um, to uh, make this more flexible uh, by prices, by information, and by different types of uh, behavioral uh, interventions, um, but this works potentially rather mildly. Um, so I think it would be helpful to have more conceptual research on household energy or electricity demand um, and as well as some more internationally diverse um, um, evidence, I think, because we, we have seen that most of this literature comes from U.S. data, uh, but um, the dem energy demand is very different, uh, in, for example, in, in the U.S. from uh, Europe, uh, because we have uh, simply um, um, different technologies uh, like uh, heating and cooling uh, with, with electricity, you know, with, with, which is uh, not common no, in, in some parts of the world simply. No? So I, you have to take this into account. Um, and. Um, and we have to as well think of a little bit ahead of these uh, new digitalization uh, possibilities, uh, which could make uh, electricity more um, more flexible so on the role of prosumers in the future. I said at the moment this is not really an issue, um, but we should not trust the tyranny of the status quo too much, but think a little bit ahead of these type of developments. And I just want to give you uh, uh, two. Uh, slides why this is the case, um, coming from Aurora, um, Cameron, uh, Cameron's company, uh, and, and showing uh, that there are really potentials for disruptive de developments uh, in uh, PV. So here you can see um, if you assume uh, learning curves uh, of or learning rates of 23% for every doubling of installed capacity of PV, we are now uh, at the situation where um, uh, PV is uh, is a one percent of worldwide final energy consumption. If you uh, if you uh, look ahead, uh, making that three percent, you can see that uh, these costs uh, might go down by sixty percent. If you look ahead um, and um, uh, think that uh, PV can capture fifteen percent. 
uh, of the market share, uh, then uh, you can uh, think about reductions in um, uh, the capex of about 80%. So these things are really massive uh, in the future. And of course, uh, uh, it's not only the PV system, but as well the battery costs. So um, uh, at the moment, if you look at the uh, car market, uh, um, the uh, number of um, uh, registered vehicles that are all electric is practically non-existent. Um, if they are able to catch one or two percent of the market, uh, uh, and you assume again a learning rate of something like 20 percent, you can you can um, um, project that. Costs might go down um, for li li uh, lithium ion battery uh, capex uh, by 60%. If they are able to ca capture around 50% of the market, uh, these costs can down by more than 90%. So that shows you that there's an, a huge potential in these technologies, which would, of course, shift totally um, the incentives uh, for um, investments in these technologies uh, and, um, and uh, in flexibility and in distributed generation. So um, in these uh, scenarios, and this is now uh, again something uh, for Germany, you can assume that uh, if, if you have these disruptive um, um, situations, uh, in uh, 15 to 20 years from now on, uh, uh, you, you might face a PV installation that is not 40 gigawatt, uh, but that is uh, something in the range of 160 uh, uh, or more gigawatt uh, uh, coming out of these massive uh, uh, cost reductions that we are seeing now. And that will have, of course, profound um, impacts on the energy demand uh, that we are facing in the future. Thanks. Thank you.